Good morning, church. Good morning, family. Good to be with you this good day. And to all those who are online with us, welcome. My name is Laura Geddes. I'm one of the clergy here at Grace St. Luke's. And we are a community that's striving to be one of hope, of belonging, of healing. And we are honored that you are trusting us and joining us this good day. A few announcements to share. The deadline for gathering in small groups, in-person small groups, that will be taking place later this month is today. If you'd like more information, details are in the back of your service leaflet. Also, the youth are meeting today outside to create joy packets and bags, so contact AMSI if you want to be a part of that. That's this afternoon. And the children continue with their wonderful prayer kits and prayer tables and a movable altar. And next Sunday will be their first time to gather in person with appropriate safety protocols on Anchor Hill. Reservations are important and necessary, so sign up for those if you'd like. And finally, um, I recognize a name, if you haven't seen it already, our wonderful um, stewardship campaign and the information that has gone out. Uh, take a good look at our um, information. Uh, you all are so generous and this place uh, benefits from that good generosity and um, you will hear more about it through uh, a ministry minute and through Chapman Morrow and through other clergy, but just want to name the goodness of the generosity that is here already and that is already beginning to flow through our good uh, stewardship campaign. So thank you for that. So now I would invite you to take a breath, if you will, in those good masks of yours. Take a breath and let it out nice and easy. One more time. Breathe in. Notice that pause at the top and breathe out. Welcome to Grace St. Luke's. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen.
Please be seated for our readings. And let us read together responsibly by whole verse a portion of Psalm 145. I will exalt you, O God, my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day will I bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. There is no end to his greatness. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your power. I will ponder the glorious splendor of your majesty and all your marvelous works. You shall speak to the mind of your wondrous acts, and I will tell of your greatness. They shall publish the remembrance of your great goodness. They shall sing of your righteous deeds. The Lord is gracious and full of kindness, slow to anger and of great kindness. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go out into the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again at about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And at about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give each of them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I gave to you. And I am, am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Here ends the lesson. This morning, as we explore today's gospel lesson, maybe you, like I, are thinking that Jesus, as the saying goes, done quit preaching and gone to meddling. You ever heard that before? Our Lord said to one of the first of the clearly confused laborers, friend, take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. That's disturbing if we're being honest because most of us enjoy being upfront. Even if we try and be humble and quiet about it, we like to just sort of ease in in the front, even at Trader Joe's like I did the other day, sorry. From this story, it is evident that God is calling us to think about how we do what we do. It is evident that the gospel calls us to be people who are generous and about justice, 
and about equity. Our lesson from Matthew, the 20th chapter, beginning at the first verse, follows pivotal events for those on the journey with Jesus, either as main characters in the story, bystanders, or even first-time readers. Immediately before the passage in Matthew 19, the disciples have given up everything they have to follow Jesus. So Jesus knows what can take place. Jesus is ready to see what's next in them. And our Lord comforts them with the fact that they will receive eternal life, which the rich young man found too costly, which was the story. God in Christ Jesus tells them that their reward will include sharing authority. Who doesn't want some level of power, right, and authority in the new age? A new Israel will unfold by their faithful and fair leadership. They will be a part of change. They will be a part of a new future. Jesus also promises that all true followers will share in a rich inheritance. Prosperity will come from obedience to his commandments and his ways of living and being in the world. Life will be great. Things will be different and they will be the ones who make it better. But most important, and for our ears, and I would say our actions today, discipleship is twofold. Giving up much that is valuable in human terms, and then the other part is guaranteeing followers an indescribable reward. So a giving up and a receiving, a giving and a receiving. I don't think it's a coincidence that we are hearing about this just as Grace St. Luke's has begun a stewardship campaign. Long ago, you know, they scheduled these readings, but they seem to time out just for the fall every year, right? Our stewardship campaign, Resilience and Connection by Giving. Our campaign co-chairs, Allison and Stephen King, and the stewardship committee invite us to give sacrificially and as my colleague Laura said, we already are a generous people, but imagine if we practice that even more, how this parish will flourish and how others will be drawn to be a part of us solely by our generosity. But our gospel, our gospel reveals that in God's kingdom that followers of Jesus seek to co-build in the present time, in the here and now, Ordinary human values are reversed. And that is the part that disturbs us, that changes things for us if we're being completely honest. The faithful's lives and priorities actually are reversed and may be turned upside down. This means that many who are first in the present pattern or order of things will be last in the new order. And so long ago, the Pharisees this was the case with the rich young man. It means that those who fall in categories often referred to as lowly positions, you know the list, the poor, the humble, the meek, children, any who are marginalized, oppressed, and treated as unequal, that list can go on and on and on. They will be first in the kingdom unsettling as this may be my friends Jesus's meddling illustrates a paradoxical concept that the first will be last and the last first equity will exist in a way that will look like the dream of God something that we strive for we pray for that we can be a part of in our lives today imagine an equitable world that is what breaks our hearts even as we are polarized in so many ways, equity, equity, equity. That's what the gospel is all about. Now, to be clear, the laborers in the vineyard parable is not a commentary on economic justice. This is often used in that context. Instead, it is a rather timely message about what one commentator calls a boundless generosity of God boundless generosity of God. Knowing the immense power of a first century Palestinian landowner, Jesus compares powerful popular position to God's freedom. 
God's freedom to dispense gifts wherever God wills, that throws any of us. How can God be so equitable when we've worked so hard and have done so much and have been in certain positions? How can it be that those who have done absolutely nothing, for whatever reason, how can they be treated in the same way? Begrudging God's generosity is inappropriate because there is enough for all. But for whatever reason, I know I'm guilty of this, we operate culturally out of a place of scarcity versus abundance. And Jesus takes issue with that throughout all of Scripture. And at the end of the day, followers of Jesus, you and I and those throughout the world who follow him are called to be about the holy business of generosity, justice, and equity. This we can learn from a lot of people, and maybe you already have a list running of people who live in that way. We can learn from all sorts and conditions of children of God, including Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who died on Friday. She's on my mind today as I ponder my faith, our baptismal covenant, and the call to be as much like Jesus as we are humanly able to always do what Jesus would do in the name of love goes across lines of religion and faith, of no religion and no faith. Most recently, Justice Ginsburg is on my mind, particularly as I have studied today's good news for many years. Many of you have read our passage and spent time with it, but of course, as preacher, I've been sitting with it a lot, sitting with it a lot until today. But these words, her words, Ginsburg's words, she shared how she would like to be remembered. She said, someone who used whatever talent she had to do her work to the very best of her ability and to help repair tears in our society, to make things a little better through the use of whatever ability she has, to do something, as my colleague David Sauter would say, outside myself, because I've gotten much more satisfaction for the things that I've done for which I was not paid. Imagine if we lived with that level of openness and vulnerability and generosity because we've gotten much more satisfaction for the things that we've done for which we are not paid. Humbled by these words, my friends, I cannot help but think generosity and justice, no pun intended, <laughs> justice, equity, and grace. Furthermore, I would add that grace is what she practiced in her relationship with friends. Many know her story of her judicial adversary and yet her best friend. You think about Antonin Scalia and their relationship and how they were able to be in relationship. And at his funeral, she said this. He was once asked how we could be friends given our disagreements on lots of things. She said, Justice Scalia answered, I attack ideas. I don't attack people. Some very good people have some very bad ideas. <laughs> that has stuck with me because we, as the human family, are called to agree to disagree. That makes us human, and yet God can do something new with us. And so clearly, they had a simple respect for and friendship with each other as an example that can guide our country to a more perfect union. And that gives me hope in the face of all that we are facing. Dear friends in Christ, imagine. Imagine how different and better this world would be, this broken, polarized, unreconciled world would be if those who follow Jesus and any who believe in true love and God's love did all things with the spirit of generosity and of justice and of equity, and to that we add grace. In our Lord's meddling, we are being called to lean in, 
to lean in and to give from abundance and to do what we are able to make life and this world for better, far better for others and ourselves than it is. That is hopeful because of the community of the church and examples of beacons of love and transformation such as this. May we be so encouraged. May we practice our faith boldly. Amen. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world for our diocesan Bishop Phoebe, presiding Bishop Michael, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin. For this gathering and for all ministers and people, pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him. I ask your prayers for the departed, especially Brian Deloyd Kellett and Larry Thomas. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for the special needs and concerns of this congregation, including those reflected on the prayer list in the service leaflet. And I ask your thanksgivings for the birth of Jerry Walter Walt Adair. Praise God for those in every generation in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our own day. Loving God, we pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in the midst of life. To honor and glory in your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Good people of God, may the peace of the Lord be always, always with you. Let us pass the peace. Please be seated and we welcome Sandra Ireland for our ministry minutes. Sandra. As Laura said, I'm Sandra Ireland and I'm a member of the stewardship committee and also representing you on the Grace St. Luke's Vestry. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 14, Paul writes to the community in Corinth and he asks them, let all that you do be done in love. And I thought that was a fitting thought to apply to each of us as we discern our pledge for the next year to Grace St. Luke's. But before we can do, let us recognize what it is that we love about Grace St. Luke's. Is it this gorgeous sacred space we worship in? Is it the beautiful music from our organs and our angelic choirs under the direction of Dr. Scott and Debbie Smith? Is it the care and concern and love that we get from Father Ollie and Reverend Laura in times of deep loss or depression, illness? Or is it the joy that we get in times of 
celebrations such as baptisms and weddings? Or is it all of you here and online that relish the opportunity to be in community with each other, to feel at home here, to feel loved, to feel spiritually enriched? Is it all these things that you love and many, many more? So if it is, I ask of you, and I paraphrase Paul, as you decide to make your pledge this year for Grace St. Luke's, do it in love. But more importantly, do it with love. The love that you have for this wonderful church. Thank you. I can't really say much after that. Thank you, Sandra Ireland. Just to recognize that your gifts do go to glorify the goodness of God here, and there are so many good ways to make that gift known via mail, via text, you name it. And all of that information is in your service leaflet. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And together, may we say our spiritual communion prayer. In union, blessed Jesus, with the faithful gathered at every altar of your church, where your blessed body and blood are offered this day, and remembering particularly Grace St. Luke's and those worshiping there, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory, and particularly for the blessings given me. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until, by your grace, I come to your glorious kingdom in unending peace. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. Be my wisdom and guide me in right Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness, and in the power of your gracious light, rule over our life. Good people, as we begin to make our way to the conclusion of our service, I remind you that at the close, please wait for an usher to come to your pew or make yourself known that you're ready to leave by standing and an usher will come to your pew to escort you out. Thank you for helping us stay safe and honor our safety protocols. And now, may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be remain with you and be with you always. Amen. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen.